Welcome to Lifestyle Solopreneur, the community for entrepreneurs who put lifestyle first. Join your host, Flavia Barris, as she interviews successful lifestyle solopreneurs and shares ideas to help you find the perfect balance between lifestyle, business, and self. Flavia is an attorney, marketing expert, and founder of several online academies. She's been featured in major media, including BBC World News, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Post, ESPN Television, and more. Join us for this episode of Lifestyle Solopreneur. Hey, Lifestyle Solopreneurs. Today, we get to speak with Nick and Jamie Cooper. Nick saw the power of cash flowing assets with his single family rentals, but he was ready to scale. He sold his remaining single family rentals in San Diego and got Jamie on board to reinvest in real estate on a much larger scale. Together, they purchased a 24-unit apartment complex in Ohio to create passive income. In the first year, they optimized their systems and as a result, more than doubled the property's value. They saw firsthand the power of multifamily real estate investing as an opportunity to create passive income and build wealth for their family. Nick brings a pilot's precision and analytical mind to multifamily real estate with over 22 years as a military helicopter pilot. Jamie delivers an unwavering resolve towards producing results and an innate ability to build relationships with over a decade in medical sales. Jamie and Nick saw that their skills would be the perfect fit for multifamily real estate investing. And at present, Hudson Blue, their company owns 292 units in Missouri, Texas, Alabama, Ohio, and Virginia. We are valued at $29 million in assets under management, they are proud to say. Welcome to the show, Nick and Jamie. Hey, thanks for having us on. Hello there. Hello, hello. Well, there's some kind of cool things about this episode. Number one, I should say this up front. I know the two of you personally because my husband is also a pilot, a retired helicopter pilot, was in the Navy. And Nick and my husband, you got to work together for many years. And I consider you both dear, dear friends of mine which is not always the case with my episodes. I get to meet a lot of people for the first time on this show, which is also really fun. And I get to kind of expand my circle and my my network of successful people that I know. But when I get to bring on my own friends that I've known and kind of watch the whole journey myself, so I can kind of attest to like, I have witnessed you go from A to like well beyond Z. And I get to have you on here and sort of share you with the world loving this. <laughs> yeah. It's very flattering. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the awesome intro. We definitely appreciate it, Flavia. So for people who don't know you, how are you related? I know the answer to this, but introduce yourselves and then kind of go a little bit deeper into that journey from where you were before to what you are doing now. Yes. So we are husband and wife. We have been in this business, I guess you could say for almost five years, when we first met, Nick was transitioning into real estate and had mentioned it to me, but hadn't fully pulled the trigger in multifamily. He had been a landlord in single family in San Diego for like 17 years at that point. And obviously being a helicopter pilot is a really cool job when you're single, but when you are not single and (laughs) we knew we wanted to have a family and things like that in the future and a job that didn't require him to fly in the middle of the night and wasn't quite as dangerous. That's kind of the transition that happened in multifamily. And yeah. I think that with everything, thanks Jamie for that, is it comes to an end and then you have to decide whether it's on your terms or someone else's terms. And I think like a lot of folks, when you're leaving a career, I was at this point, 19 years, almost 20 years into a, you know my 22 career. And I was like, what is next? Do I want to be an airline pilot afterwards? Which, you know, nothing wrong is that, but, but I felt that I had a stronger desire to create something and, and build something. And with Jamie, I was like, man, I have to kind of get it together. You have someone that you want to perform for and you want to be able to show like, hey, this is the way. And how do I do that? I did that by putting my money where my mouth was, is that I looked at 
one day I was like, well, I had a couple of rentals in San Diego. I did the math real quick. And I was like, whoa, I make a hundred dollars a month on this property. This is like a hobby. This isn't an income. So I did a quick Google search of how to make money in real estate. This is, you know, five and a half plus years ago. And it was like, oh, multifamily. So kind of fast forward, I did read a bunch of books, did some podcasts, listened to podcasts, wasn't on them at the time. <laughs> and I went out and networked like crazy and flew out to the market I picked was Ohio. So I knew it was more of a better price point for me compared to like San Diego. And about three and a half months later, I found, you know, I found a 24 unit and closed on it. And I went from making a hundred dollars a month on that to almost six thousand dollars. And that's something that you look at, that's actually, you know, it per does month. per month. Yeah. Yeah. That's at present date. That's about how much we bring in every month, give or take from that property. And to have that capital be put to work and go from making $100 a month in San Diego to well over 4000 most months, sometimes 6000 is pretty crazy that that same amount of capital could yield that in a different state and in a, a different type of real estate than we had it here. Yeah. And then to add to Jamie real quick is that with single family, I was like most, many folks in the military, you become a landlord by default. So after 16, 17 years, I had just a couple of properties and I like, you can't, it's very difficult to scale. You can, but it's difficult. So I was able to get 24 units in three months. It took me a decade and a half plus to get just a few units in San Diego. And for the 101, right? For the, the basics, when we say single family versus multifamily, for anyone that's listening who's not in the real estate world, let's break that down. Like, what is the difference? And why were you able to sell a single family home in San Diego and sort of convert that into so many more units or doors somewhere else? Like, why did you have to shift geography to do this? Perfect. Just because San Diego is such a expensive market. So it was just a single family, actually it was a townhouse. And those townhouses here, you know, are half a million dollars plus. Whereas I was able to go to Ohio and get 24 units for about the same price, you know, just a couple hundred thousand dollars more. To give you an idea, I sold my place in San Diego, the last one I had for just about $570,000. And I bought the 24 unit in Ohio for $760,000. And what I did was I did what's called a 1031 exchange where you can sell a property and defer the taxes on it. So I sold the property to San Diego, took all of the profit and put it into the property in Ohio. That's amazing. It kind of makes you think, shouldn't everyone who owns investment property in California just sell and and reinvest that money and that equity somewhere else? But there are also reasons to be invested in sort of the, the higher price point markets as well. I mean, there's plenty of apartment complexes down the street and everywhere you look in a place like coastal California. So what are kind of the, the differences? And real estate investing is great because I think it's kind of like a big buffet. I mean, there's all kinds of different right. strategies and things you can do and, and ways you can get involved. And everyone sort of ends up finding like their favorite flavor or their favorite food to get at the buffet. But there's other people that think differently. So why would some people invest in coastal California at all when what you're talking about is so possible? So I think that, like you just said, said, the greatest thing about real estate is there isn't just one way to win. There's so many different avenues you can take to be successful in real estate. And if you choose to go to the route of storage units, or you choose to go the route of mobile homes, or say you're really into the short-term rentals and Airbnbs, there's so many different avenues. And I think depending on a market, that also determines your options. And somewhere like San Diego, that is very desirable for people to be visiting, it may make more sense for you if you live in San Diego to take that money and do a short-term rental and make a high yield return maybe five months out of the year and then do maybe travel nurses or something else the remainder of the year. There isn't one option in our opinion to really be successful in real estate. The one thing that 
we both believe is whatever you do decide, become an expert in that. We have so many friends who are so successful in different avenues in San Diego, in short-term rentals, in mobile home parks, in storage, all of these things. And we believe you can be successful at any of those things. We just chose to really take our skill set and hone in on becoming experts in multifamily out of state and places that had different taxes and also different landlord tenant laws that just don't exist here in California and in San Diego. That's where we decided to become experts. And if you look at the places we own, you see themes. And the themes are, it's a lot of places that aren't that exciting. It's places that Ohio, we own in a place called Painesville. It's a really small place outside of Cleveland. In Alabama, we own in Mobile. Not very many people have heard of it. We own in these tertiary markets, meaning we don't own in the really sexy Austin, Texas. We own in Corpus Christi. We own in these areas outside of these larger markets because that's what we have found to be our success point. But I think there's so many different avenues to find that success. And specifically in San Diego, you were asking, you know, these coastal areas, why you would buy there. The answer would be, you have a lot more capital to start with. And maybe you're never planning to move or want to get on a plane to go see your properties. Well, those definitely limit you to where you live. So that wasn't something that was holding us back. So at some point in time, you grew beyond just investing your own capital, your own investments, and you've grown to something bigger. Tell us about that. I think like most folks that do real estate is that eventually you run out of your own capital. So I did the first deal 100% my own money, no investors. So that's where you learn, you cut your teeth and you kind of figure out your systems and that's what we did. And then after we got comfortable with that, year and a half later, we did what's called a syndication. That's where you bring in other investors and we run the deal investors invest their their hard-earned capital alongside of us and get a return. And we take the risk by signing on the loan. The investors don't sign on the loan. We're taking that risk. True. So vocabulary, syndication. So syndication. So what? how would you sort of define the world of syndication? And how does that sort of fit in? Is that something that's used just for multifamily? Is that something that you see widely used in the world of real estate? I kind of know the answer to this, so I might be teeing up a question. (laughs) And I know you do as well, but I think there are people listening that have never even heard of the term syndication. Think about this as where you have a group that gets together and pools your resources to buy a set investment vehicle. It could be multifamily. It could be self-storage, RV parks and whatnot. You can do syndications with a business also as well. If someone wants to syndicate their HVAC company, you could do that as well. So just think of it as a way to, especially as the person that's running the business, to really maximize what you can get. And I know that there's so much talk right now, politicians, lawmakers, just the media, everyone is talking about the lack of housing, the lack of affordable housing. And your role in this is to and I know just because I, I also not just know the two of you on a personal level, and we've talked, but a lot of people in your industry as well, because of what I do, I, I work in real estate. And a lot of times when you go in and you say, well, we were able to raise the revenue for this building. It wasn't just that you raised rents. Like I know the, the sweat, blood, tears, equity that goes into right. making these buildings that may have been sort of dilapidated, or maybe they had some different maintenance or terrible management or It just wasn't a good place for people to live. I won't steal the punchline. So tell us a little bit about that process and what you bring to the table when it comes to providing housing for people and families and and, uh, everyone that's out there that's looking for a good, safe rental. So yeah, the biggest thing is in this industry, it's not really about how many units you have or how many buildings or anything else. What matters is everything we buy, we want to make sure we we leave better than when we bought it. And what that means is we're buying an asset that in in most cases is 
not been given enough attention. A lot of the maintenance has been deferred in most cases. And maybe the owner just didn't have the previous owner, didn't have the capital, didn't have the resources, was older, elderly, whatever it is. So we come in there and first, before we do anything, we're not going to come in and be like, oh, let's raise rents and great, let's kick everyone out. Our biggest thing is making sure that we're improving the quality of life for any of our tenants and the people that live there. And with that means fixing deferred maintenance, adding things in each of the units that maybe haven't been updated, even small things like, oh, new sockets and light fixtures or whatever it may be. And making sure that we're adding value before we're then saying, okay, great, your rent is going to go up. So making sure that the people who live there feel at least taken care of, like, okay, yeah, my rent is going to go up. It's way below what everything in the area is. But also the new owners are actually taking care of things that haven't been taken care of. So that's our goal. That's first and foremost of what we try to do with every single property we've bought and continue to purchase and adding value, whether that's, how can that be done? Well, you can do that by charging back utilities. So we can single meter the utilities. And what that means is you're paying either a specific portion or a flat fee for your water, your electric, your trash, things like that. And so that increases the value. We are adding laundry mats or I mean laundry at the different places if they didn't have it. Okay, well, that adds value. Like there's so many different aspects from very small to much larger. Where do you go from here? So what are the goals for the company? What are you planning on the horizon for the next year, five year, 10 year plan? The next, you know, on the horizon. So what we're looking to do, and it's it's kind of a common or common theme across multifamily, which is people invest in apartment complexes, is we've been in the class C space, which means class C is is more of workforce housing. So think like blue collar workers, those type of folks. So we're Jamie and I and our company are transitioning to more the B class and better B classes. Think about stuff that's built in the last. 20 years or so, whereas our first things that we were buying was 1960s, 1970s vintage. So we're looking to have stuff that has a little bit less maintenance and a little bit, the demographic where it commands a a higher rent. So that's where we're moving out towards is is the uh, higher class assets. That's exciting. But I know you you both have hobbies and passions and things you love to do. Does this type of career still give you the opportunity to have a lot of freedom in your calendar? And what are some of your favorite hobbies and passions that you like to to do either together or maybe the two of you have sort of separate interests as well? So yeah, I mean, to be super blunt, I think owning your business the first several years is a lot of work. And we are still probably in that part of this. (laughs) We do have our own business. And that means that there's really no days off. We love to travel, but with owning a business at this point, this size, even when we're traveling, whether that's overseas in Europe or even in Mexico or wherever, there's never a day where unfortunately we aren't on some kind of calls, emails, meetings. At this point, we are the business. And so we don't get the opportunity to ever be fully off. And I think more people maybe don't talk about that. Yes, you have more time freedom in the sense of you can decide to go to Europe for two weeks, whatever. But that means you're probably going to be working 30 or 40 hours while you're there. And so I think that's just a reality at this point that we're still in. <laughs> yeah, I think we're, we're in the trenches now. So I think a lot of it, let me add to what Jamie said so eloquently, is that in business... And I think of all business, and I'll include especially real estate, that there are always going to be fires, be it a loan due, be it like a literal fire, or you have some type of issue with your business and it's how you put them out. So you really got to think about this isn't just a set it and forget it. That part of the business is for the investors that invest with us. We do all the work. Yeah. For the passive investor, it's absolutely awesome. 
because you are getting the benefit. You are not getting the phone calls. You are not jumping on a plane at 8 a.m. because you had a call at 11 p.m. the night before about a flood or whatever it is. But we are the ones running it. So we we get to jump in and wear all hats. And that's the reality of owning a business. And so at this point, it is still a lot of work. We are having our first child. And one of the exciting things in owning your own business is Nick will be working from home. That doesn't mean he's not working. He will definitely be working, but it's not like when he was on a helicopter where he'd be gone for days or months or the middle of the night. So the benefits kind of, they do outweigh the latter, but we can. Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. But it's still a good amount of stress and a lot of work at this point. Well, and for being in an industry where you do have a lot of demand on your time and there's a lot going on and a lot of moving pieces, what are some of your favorite apps or software or just techniques or ways to be efficient, to be productive, and um, to not waste any of your precious time? Time blocking has helped me the most as far as just use Google Calendar and block your time, even block your free time. Because I wake up very early. He wakes up at like 4, 4.30, which is insane. So, and pretty much you realize that after you wake up, you do some work and you go work out, the day kind of gets you. And all those things you want to do get away from you. So I'd say definitely for efficiency, I would definitely say the time blocking is, is the way. And even include free time. People usually just fill it with work, but you need to schedule in free time, time with your dog, time with your wife. I think especially as an entrepreneur, that's something that Nick could work away for days and hours and he forgets, oh yeah, (laughs) you're a human. You have to take breaks. You have to have scheduled fun in there too. (laughs) I totally agree. I mean, we're we're cut from the same cloth, I think. (laughs) Yes, you guys are. (laughs) Trips, your fun time, all of your hobbies, you know, time for all the things. Because what are we really working towards and what are we working for if we're not actually enjoying ourselves at least to some degree as well, even while building a business? Because like you said, you're in a stage of the business where you are in ultra growth mode, right? You're like leverage, expansion. Oh, well, Nick, I'll call it a runway. (laughs) Like you are just like taking off. And, And that is busier and that is exciting. But what are ways that you think in the future, the business might shift for you as far as the demands on your personal time? Or do you think it'll just kind of grow from here or just continue the same way? Well, right now we're really not purchasing anything. We just, we closed on two properties or sorry, three properties in the last few months. And so right now we are really dedicated in this next, you know, season of life to really just running the properties we have as efficiently as possible and kind of watching the market and seeing what happens. And at this point, not expanding too much. Besides our family. (laughs) Yeah, we're expanding our family, but our portfolio, we really just want to hone in and do the best job we can with the current assets we have. So there's people listening, sitting either maybe at a job they don't like, at a desk that's not their happy place, They could be actually entrepreneurs already, but maybe doing something completely unrelated to real estate, or maybe they're having second thoughts or struggling. And it's really easy in life to wonder, hey, is there something more? Is there something different? And for anybody that's stuck in that sort of uncertainty, what kind of advice would you offer to them to help them make some of the shifts that you've made in life to really pursue your dreams and to do the things that you want to do? I think that... Everyone has a reason for everything and you have to have a strong why because especially as an entrepreneur, it's a very lonely place. It really is. A lot of your W2 friends and nothing to be a son, but they're, they won't understand kind of how this works. And you have to have a strong why, like with a W2 or a normal job, you have a ceiling, which you can make usually. I mean, of course, there's salespeople can make more, but an entrepreneur, there's no limit but you have to be able to look in the mirror every day and motivate yourself. Like, do you have that motivation when you don't want to do something to still go and do it? Because no one's holding you accountable. Well, except for my wife here. (laughs) But I think that you really have to look in the mirror and be like, is this something that I can do even when I don't want to get up and do it? That is amazing advice. I mean, I could, and I have 
chatted with you for hours <laughs> in the past. <laughs> so I could sit here and ask you so, so many things. But obviously, we only have time to chat just a little bit on this episode. Is there anything else that you wanted to, to say? Is there a place where people can go to learn more about your company and what you're up to and to connect with you further? Yeah. So our website is Hudson, like the river, H U D S O N, blue, like the color, B L U E M F for multifamily.com. Our website is a great place. Also, we have social media. It's Hudson Blue MF, also multifamily. And then you can email me at nick at hudsonbluemf.com as well. And I I hope people take you up on that because I know you're just not only an expert and just so professional in what you do, but you're also just a great mentor to a lot of people, not just the investors that you help gather into these investment opportunities. But I know that you're just a mentor. I mean, come on, even back in your pilot days. I mean, that's just like (laughs) who you guys are. I mean, you are the most generous of spirit. And I mean, obviously it's hard to see that in a few minutes on our audio podcast, but I happen to know you're just a lot of fun, like fun, fun people. So even just to follow you on your social gives me a breath of fresh air when I see you on your travels, even though you've now admitted to me, you sometimes work on those travels. I mean, (laughs) that's adventures and that is, is so much fun. So thank you so much for sharing your time with the Lifestyle Solopreneur audience and telling us a little bit about what you're up to, how you got there and giving such great advice for people who want to either follow in your footsteps or maybe pursue some other dream. But it's all about inspiring each other, being there for one another, and uh, leading by example. So thank you for being on the show today. No, thank thank you, you, Flavia. We appreciate it. It was so fun. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us, and I hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast, and if you leave a review on iTunes, I promise I will read every single review. If you know someone who makes a full-time living from part-time work, and maybe this is you, please visit lifestylesolopreneur.com to nominate a guest or to nominate yourself. Because remember this, money doesn't buy happiness, but money in the hands of a happy person, there is no greater tool. Today's episode was brought to you by the Get Shift Done program. It's a lifestyle changing online class to help you define your business and lifestyle ambitions and to set goals in a way you've never experienced before. This class will 10x your daily productivity with methods that will blow your mind. And if you use a coupon code podcast, the class tuition is 99% off. Visit GetShiftDone.com to enroll today.